Well, it came like a thief in the night. In fact, at first I thought I was dreaming. We were living in Virginia at the time. Marion was very pregnant. The doctors had told us just a few days earlier it could happen at any time. So, when I heard the splash on the hardwood floor in the middle of the night, my instincts immediately kicked in. Before Marion could say a word, I had leapt from the bed, pulled out the bags we'd packed weeks before for the hospital, and gone to retrieve the keys to the car. This was it. This is what we prepared for. We were going to have a baby. Except that we were not. Marion looked at me and said, Nathan, calm down. I just knocked my glass of water off the bedside table. <laughs> I suppose labor is not really a good comparison. After all, there is a general timeline involved, and while you may not know exactly the day or the hour, you do have a pretty good idea about, if not the month, certainly the year. Which is part of the reason I've never really been in love with the image Jesus uses for his return in this passage from Matthew. Not only is a thief in the night completely unpredictable, it's, well, more criminal than it is comforting, especially if you've been the victim of theft before. There was a brief period of time while we were in Kentucky that Mary and I lived in the parsonage of the church she was serving. We'd been on vacation for a week and were pulling up to the driveway of the house after being gone when we noticed the glass to the back door had been shattered. Immediately shaken, I told Mary and the kids to stay in the car while I went into the house, trembling from my head to my toes. Thankfully, the thief had been long gone, but he did make away with most of Marion's jewelry, much of which had been handed down to her by family members who were now deceased. The truth is, no matter when and how a thief might come, you don't get much sleep after that. You tend to sort of live on your toes, always suspicious, always expecting the unexpected, but in the worst possible way. Which, if I'm honest, is, is no way to live. Or as I once heard it said, a life lived in fear is no life at all. However, I'm not sure Jesus' emphasis is so much on being afraid of what's happened or what's to come, as much as it is about being prepared for today. After all, we can become so worried with dwelling on what has been or, or predicting what will be that we forget about what is. Take anyone who's tried to predict Jesus' second coming, for example. And you can become so preoccupied with your calculations that you forget about your neighbors. I mean, once you've figured out who's in and, and who's out and when God's coming to get you, then why waste your time on any of those folks who will be left behind? And I'm not just talking about religious sects or cults here. No, I'm speaking about the human condition. I mean, when that person with a hungry look in her eye approaches you, do you treat her like the last person who did the same, despite her story likely being completely different? Do you sometimes find it hard to meet someone new because you've become so comfortable with those you already know? Do you project your past experiences onto everyone else's present because it's easier to live in the same narrative than to believe a different one is possible? Of course, focusing on the future isn't all that different either. What about all those good intentions we have to work on those relationships that need tending in our lives but just can't seem to get around to? And what about those spiritual disciplines we're going to start soon or that self-care plan we're going to implement in the near future or that generous gift we're planning to make just down the road? You know, I'm going to be better soon. I'm going to get there. I, I, I promise. Meanwhile, this vision of the future gets me off the hook for today, holding me back from what could be. Because you see, whether it's going the past or planning for the future, we can fool ourselves into believing that time will forever expand in either direction to meet our needs. 
I suppose that's the reason one of my wife's mentors early on in her ministry sat her down one afternoon and handed her a book entitled, Why the World Will End in 1982. He then said to her, If anyone ever tells you Jesus is coming back at a specific time, give them a copy of this book and remind them of what Matthew writes in the 24th chapter. But about that day, an hour, no one knows. Therefore, be prepared. Over the holiday weekend, my family went to see the new film about Fred Rogers called A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. Some of you may have seen it too. The movie's based on a true story about the beloved children's television show host, Mr. Rogers. Although the movie is less about Mr. Rogers and more about Lloyd Vogel, a writer for Esquire magazine commissioned to write a story about Fred. Vogel himself is mired in his past, holding on to a resentment against his father. Rogers, while being interviewed by Vogel throughout the film, tries to help Vogel work through this past more than answer questions about his own. There are many memorable moments in the film, but one is particularly poignant. Vogel and Rogers are eating lunch at a restaurant, and Mr. Rogers says, you know, I try to live more in the present than in the past or the future. You see, I want to make sure that every person in front of me is the most important person to me in that moment. And that I appreciate all the people who've brought us together for that brief period of time. So sometimes I take just a minute, 60 seconds, to remember the presence of that person, all those who have loved us, and to be. All of a sudden, the whole restaurant grows quiet, as does Vogel and Rogers. And for an entire minute, everyone in the scene grows eerily serious some even tearing up, thinking of and appreciating all those folks who have brought them to that very moment. And then the camera zooms in on Roger's character's face, played by Tom Hanks. And he directs his gaze right into the camera, as if to invite everyone in the theater to do the very same. I couldn't help but find myself completely enamored by the present. Not by what I'd done up to that point in the day or what I needed to do tomorrow, but simply grateful for that very moment. And those seated around me were watching this movie, of all things. Rogers may have been a Presbyterian minister, but he certainly wasn't Jesus. Although in that moment he became the embodiment of the words we find in Matthew today. After all, if we cannot know the day or the hour, isn't preparing for the coming of Christ about what we do in the here and the now? That's certainly what I recall a divinity school professor of mine saying at one point. She said, I don't know how or when the world will literally come to an end. What I do know is that someone's world is ending even right now. Which is the reason Christ hasn't just come, nor is Christ only coming. But rather, Christ is already here. And Christ is always coming. And I suspect if you were to think about it, you know what I mean. Like when a path somehow opened up, despite facing a seeming dead end. Or when it felt like your proverbial world was ending, but it turned out to be just the dawning of a new day. Or when that stranger showed up like a bright light in the midst of your darkest hour. My best friend from college, whose name also happens to be Nathan, was leaving a party just over three years ago when he tumbled down a set of stairs and hit his head and immediately went into a coma. In fact, he was in that coma for several months. The doctors didn't think he would live, let alone have any kind of cognitive functioning future. Miraculously, though, and I don't use that term lightly, 
He awoke one day from his slumber and since then has almost made a full recovery. He texts me about just every week. You may have even seen his comments or likes on our church's Facebook page. It's obvious he sees life differently, having almost lost his own. And the way he seemingly takes advantage of every single day. On Thanksgiving Day, he sent me this text message. On this day, I'm reflecting on the past. And yet I can't help but count my blessings in the present. I thank you for your friendship and your prayers and your kindness during this very challenging time for Cassie and me. The last two years have made me mindful of many things. Not the least of which is the many ways God continues to show up in my life. And that's the hope of this season, isn't it? The hope for which we light a candle on this first Sunday of Advent. It's a different kind of hope. One that comes to us into the darkest corner of our lives over and over again when we least expect it but need it the most. Maybe it's in the presence of family and friends who we didn't even know were there. Perhaps it's in the form of healing we never thought possible. Maybe it's come in some kind of reconciliation we never dreamed would take place. Regardless, at least according to Matthew, about that day and hour, no one ever knows. So, in the meantime, he writes, be ready. But how, might you ask? Well, for starters, rather than dwelling on yesterday or waiting for tomorrow, why not wake up every morning to decide to live the life God's given you today? After all, there's no time for reliving yesterday or saving your best self for tomorrow, no matter how much time we might have. So make that decision. Say, I'm sorry. Send that note. Get the help you need. Find someone to love. Give yourself away. Why waste your time making preparations for an end time you cannot predict? Instead, why not live prepared, live with hope, live a caught-up life, not a put-off life, so that wherever you are, standing in line at the grocery store, or sitting in your office at work, or just going about the everyday business of your life, you're ready for God, for whatever happens next, not afraid, but wide awake, watching for the Lord who never tires, coming into this world. I mean, who knows? Along the way, you might just find yourself arriving in someone's life who never saw you come. Like a thief in the night, stealing away the hatred or resentment or cynicism, they never thought they could give up on their own. You never know. It might just be you who makes possible Christ's coming into the world again. Don't get me wrong. Realize such a scenario would be completely unexpected for you and for them. Which is what this season 